Hello, we're having a conversation with Lucas Rentzler. He's a graduating economist from Texas A&M University. Welcome, Lucas. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So you do research on common value auctions. Can you tell us what is a common value auction? Well, a common value auction uh, is any, any auction. You know, people submit bids, um, you know, the highest bid wins, and they um, get the good and you know, pay some price. It may be their bid or uh, the second price or on the second bid. Um, and a common, when we say common value, it's just any auction where all of the bidders value that good that's for sale uh, the same. And usually, um, we think that there's uncertainty as to how much it's worth. So can you give us an example of a common value auction or a good that is usually thought of as a common value auction good? Sure. Uh, a great example is sort of auctions for mineral rights. Think of oil companies that uh, or want to buy a, or buy a lease on, a, uh, on some land to get the oil underneath. Nobody knows how much oil is there. Presumably all these uh, firms value that oil the same given that they just want to sell it uh, once they've you know, extracted it. It kind of extends to you know, any time businesses want to buy something with the purpose of selling it uh, later, presumably all firms would be able to sell it at the same price. And so we can think of that as common value. Great. So I heard that uh, this week there was in the news some potential conflict between Argentina and the British government due to uh, possible uh, oil uh, around the Falcon Islands. Uh, they don't know whether, uh, according to what I saw, they don't know whether it's 1 billion or 50 billion barrels. So I think that would fit pretty well. And no matter who owns that, it's pretty much the same value, but no one knows exactly how much oil is there. Exactly, yeah. Great. So, so what are the, the main implications of a common value auction? Or what tends, I mean, why is it interesting to study common value auctions? Um, well, it's a huge array of goods and services that you know, get sold in auctions, and a lot of these are things that we think uh, could be modeled as common value auctions. Uh, and so just in terms of you know, policy implications, understanding behavior, um, why bidders bid the way they do, and perhaps how you can change the auction format to either maximize your revenue or, or whatever is really important. Um, okay. And w I mean, what, what is typically different in a common value auction versus an auction of a good that has a independent private values? Hmm, so an independent private value, so everybody uh, you know, has a value that doesn't depend on anybody else. And so um, you know, you, if you know your valuation, you'll never bid more than that valuation or you end up with negative profits. But what we end up seeing a lot in common value auctions is as a result of this uncertainty, you know, everybody has uh, you know, some expectation for how much it's worth. And what ends up happening is the person who wins has usually overestimated uh, and falls victim to the winner's curse. Um, and so you know, th those are two very different uh, you know, issues. So, so, so typically in common value auctions, what is expected is that the, the one who, the bidder who wins is the one who overestimated the most the, the common value good. Is that correct? That's what we see empirically. Uh, you know, theor theoretically, people should uh, right. learn to, over learn to uh, overcome that. Or uh, you know, in a, in a one-shot Nash equilibrium, they should you know, realize that, that, that possibility and account for it. Tell us a little bit about the general empirical findings, uh, specifically from experiments. Sure. Uh, there's a huge literature on, on this, um, pioneered by you know, Cagle and Levine. Uh, and there's a few sort of very robust findings that go across different auction formats uh, and to some extent across information structures as well. Um, one is that in common value auctions, people overbid, especially when they're in inexperienced. Uh, and when they're inexperienced, they're overbidding to an extent that they're uh, on average getting these negative payoffs. And it's again because people aren't taking account of the fact that if they win, they probably had the highest estimate. And if they had the highest estimate, uh, it's a first order st uh, statistic, and perhaps they should have you know, sh shaded their bid somewhat. Um, as, as people gain experience, um, you know, they learn to overcome the winner's curse. And by that, I mean they end up having you know, positive payoffs on average, but they're still overbidding relative to Nash equilibrium. And they continue to do that even uh, you know, after they've played many, many rounds. Um, I, I understand your, your work is generally on asymmetric information in common value auctions. Can you tell us what asymmetric information means in the context of common value auctions? Sure. Uh, usually, 
Uh, in most of the literature, it's just assumed that there's uncertainty about the value of this good, but everybody has some estimate of what it's, what it's worth, and only they know their estimates. Um, when we say it's symmetric information, it just means that everybody's uh, estimate is some sort of an equally precise uh, estimate of, that, of the value of that good. Um, but that's a very strong assumption, and it, you know, it allows us to get some nice uh, you know, results in, in terms of uh, you know, game theory. But it's a strong assumption to impose, uh, and so you know, relaxing that and understanding the implications of that not holding is, is important. And there's a couple ways you can model it. Uh, one is you know, perhaps one person gets an estimate, the other bidders don't, they have no private information. Or another way it's been modeled is you know, there's just varying quality of estimates. One, one bidder has a perfectly informative uh, estimate and everybody else uh, has, has noisy estimates. And what are the general findings from your research in asymmetric information in common value auctions? So the interesting result, uh, the biggest result is that uh, theory says that unambiguously, uh, if you have one person with an estimate and the other, other bidders without, that uh, revenue should be less than in a symmetric, in, symmetric information environment, and that's you know, when nobody has an estimate or everybody has this equally precise estimate. And what we end up finding uh, is, is that that doesn't necessarily hold. It does, it does hold that uh, you know, revenue is, is less relative to the case when everybody has private information. But when nobody has private information, the, it, it actually flips and you uh, increase revenue. And so understanding if we're going to assume symmetric information, understanding the way, uh, you know, in, in what sense it's symmetric is important in terms of uh, you know behavior. Okay. So, and what are the implications of, of your research? Uh, well, from a sort of ex experimental standpoint, the literature has largely uh, assumed that everybody has private information, and so we've uh looked at the case where nobody does and, and found out that you know maybe a lot of these results like we talked about people are consistently falling victim to the winner's curse uh, since that only holds true when people are getting this private information um you know we need to make sure we understand uh you know whether whether or not we're modeling it correctly and and wh why why are people underbidding and so sort of reevaluating some of the the results there and, and analyzing and trying to understand why people are underbidding when they don't have private information. Thank you, Lucas. This, le this looks like a promising research agenda. Um, I want to thank Lucas for your time, and we hope this is the first of many interviews to come here. Thank you.